Hello everybody and welcome to this evening's stream where we will be bringing you stage 8 of the Team 3R Tour of Sicily and today we've got a big one, we're going up Mount Etna I'll tell you it's hot here in the UK and I'm sure it's going to be hot out there as well so we've got a 30 kilometre race coming up for you with 1,280 metres of climbing so I'm here with my co-host Riley Harvey and uh, we're going to be taking you through all the action from today's stage as the riders climb up this fearsome volcano. Riley, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks, Mike. I'm glad I'm not doing this climb today. It looks like it's going to be brutal. Yeah, looking at the profile, they've got a nice 10-kilometer 
downhill just to get them into the swing of things, which is nice, but will mean that the climbing's <laughs> a little bit more. And then there's 20 kilometers of climbing, 1,200 meters. So it's around about six or 7% gradient all the way up. Uh, there's no super steep sections, but uh, it will be a long old climb. And uh, yeah, we'll have a look, see who we've got on the start line in a moment. And we'll bring you an update on the team standings and the, the rider standings as well throughout the race. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with these riders today. Anyone that we should be looking out for, Riley? Um, just looking through the, the list here. Um, We've got Tim Cook on the start line, who's obviously, uh, he's got a history in this race. He's been performing very well. Um, unless there's going to be some late starters, it's looking like this is one of the races that some of the guys are going to be using as, um, as a drop race. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, there's quite a few of the people that have been competing in the rest of the races who, who aren't in this one. Um, got Luke Jeffers in there. Um, he's a good rider. Always puts on a puts on a good effort. Puts on a good show. Um, you're looking at him going up against Tim Cook today, I think. Yeah. So this is a ten event series. And this is stage number eight. But it's actually your best eight results that count towards the overall leaderboard. So riders are able to scratch two of the races, two of the stages. Um, but today, you know, could be a good opportunity for someone to, to bag a hat full of points, being a slightly smaller field. They could get up there, get into the top 15 and uh, really move themselves up the standings. So it's a good opportunity and we're about 10 seconds from the start of this race. Yeah, so it's uh, for riders ranked below 3.2 watts per kilogram. Um, trying to create competition and in between some of the slightly lower powered riders and we can see Tim Cook there is, is fast from the start he's putting in a 500 watt effort here and um, trying to stretch out the field a little bit and um, that will average out over the time of the race but that, that's certainly uh, a good effort coming off the start line there yeah it looks like he's trying to do some damage right from the off there you can see the course profile he knows it's flat for the first couple of kilometers and then there will be a bit of respite as it's downhill so that might just give him a little bit of a breather before they hit that main climb not sure what Tim's like as a climber uh, maybe he's just thinking he can get out early get a little bit of a lead might just give him a little bit of a head start on that that long climb you can see at the bottom of the screen there that profile you know, there's a good old amount of red in that for <laughs> at least half of the the, the course today so uh, that's what they've got coming up. It's going to be pretty steady once they hit that 10 kilometer stage, not really much respite. So uh, yeah, maybe it's just an opportunity for Tim to make some early ground and give himself that head start at the bottom of the climb. Yeah, he's being chased up there by Scott Yarosh. Um, I don't think Scott's a, a rider who's been participating in the series as a whole. Um, obviously you can just take part in as many or as few of these races as you like um, But yeah, Scott's looking like he's he's giving chase he's not giving up on Tim there He's help holding his wheel and in this earlier part of the, the race it is quite important to try and get as much draft as you can Because obviously once you start going up that drafts gonna start diminishing for you Just looking at Evan Oystenson there, one of the other 3R riders. He's currently sitting fourth in the overall leaderboard. So he's got a current total of 47 from his seven events so far. So that's the, the total rankings of all of his seven events added together. And the lower the better. So just as a bit of comparison, Evans in fourth place with 47 points. Evo Liebrinks is in third place with 46. Mike Wareham on 44. So it's all pretty close between those guys. But then Tim Cook is on 18, so he's got a massive lead. He's never been outside the top five, so he's definitely going to be one to watch. But it's going to be, uh, there we go, there's uh, Librex currently in sixth place there on the road. So uh, Oystenson, apparently a little bit further up the road, he could be uh, leapfrogging him today. It's pretty close to get on that podium, just a couple of points between them at this stage. 
I've only bricks there, pushing out 190 watts. Just kicking it up a little bit there. Doing 41 kilometers per hour on this descent. The corners scrubbing a little bit of speed as they go into the sharper corners. And you have to try and push out there. And um, some of the viewers may have noticed it. The LMS live stream have managed to bring in the profile on the bottom of the screen there on some of the screens so that you can see how well spaced out the, the riders are on the screen and what is to come for some of these riders. Um, not so much of a surprise on this course because it is just a, a descent into the valley and then straight up the, the wall of Mount Etna. Um, but that's a useful feature for a lot of the other rides, rides and races that we cover. So Steve Noble there, he's currently fifth place in the standings. We've got Gary Birch, I noticed just a couple of places behind Noble on the road. And he's currently in ninth. And Chris Little currently doing quite well, he's in fourth on the road. And he's a couple spots ahead of uh, Gary Little on the overall leaderboard. So an opportunity here for him to, to gain a little bit more ground on Gary and just to increase that gap. But early days yet, the real test is going to come once they hit that. Around about 10 kilometres into the race and that climb really starts. You don't want to burn all your matches on the downhill section. This is a chance for you to uh, not take it casual, but gain ground if you can. But just be wary. No point lowering up before you hit that climb. Chris Little has been taking um, advantage of some of the more age categorized races on RGT at the moment as well. He's been taking part in the OTR Veteran Series, um, as well as the Team 3R Series, but it, he's been having some decent results. Uh, not not always on the podium, but um, sort of quite often heading in that direction. Sounds like he's been pretty steady. Apeard, and I think he's a new rider to this event. I don't see his name on the uh, overall leaderboard. It's good that this event is attracting new riders each week. Same as Mr. Bonover here. Yeah, it's, it's great really to see him. Day. Go on, Riley, what's that? It's great to see. It's great to see a lot of new riders coming onto the platform and the variety of events is really helping to attract them. Um, you can go for your group rides, um, ranked races, uh, weight limited races like this one and um, there's also quite a few age limited races appearing now as well or um, age ranked races which is great to, to allow everyone a, a level of competition that they can achieve. Um, you're not just going up against a stack field where there's a set number of guys who you know are going to win. You've got that little bit of a competition within the groups. Yeah, so I'm just looking here. We've got Scott Yarosh. This is his first event on uh, the RGT platform. Well, his first ranked event anyway. He's got no race history yet, so we will see how he gets on. He's going to be a little unknown quantity within this group but we can see that there's four of them come back together here on this downhill section we will have to keep an eye on Husselmans as well he's one where we will just need to keep an eye on his performance because he did race in event number one of this tour did go over that 3.2 limit so uh, he was disqualified unfortunately now that was a quite a few number of weeks ago uh, so we will just keep an eye on that he might have lost a bit of fitness since then which would bring him back down into this category we'll just see how that goes on the climb he did have did have a dnf in stage six as well and i wonder whether he um decided not to finish because of the the possible risk of disqualification. Yeah, it is possible. Don't want to point any fingers at this early stage. So uh, 
they might have had an incident or something in the real world which has affected his fitness. You know, I know around about this time last year, I was absolutely flying online and then unfortunately I had an accident out in the real world. A couple of weeks off the bike, a little bit of an injury and they set me back. So uh, anything's possible. Oh, definitely. And it's not hard to, um, to find a course that suits you. I know I've done it myself, and um, I, I ride, ride around the 3.2 watt per kilogram. Um, but on a course that suits me, I, I can quite often, with standing efforts, beat that. Um, but not generally in the in the general ride. Um, on most courses, I would be be underneath that 3.2. But just on the odd occasion, I can find a course that suits me, suits my sort of uh, power band, and I can um, I can get up past the 3.2 and. And get myself disqualified if I wanted to. No, not that I plan on that. <laughs> well, today could be that sort of course, couldn't it? You don't have much opportunity once it starts going uphill to sit in and ease off. Because at three point two, that's based on your average across the whole race. And uh, I think today, once they hit that climb, it's going to be a pretty steady effort. It's going to be not much chance for for easing off. So you're going to be pretty much threshold the whole way up. I'd have thought. And, that's really going to reveal what people's true what's the kilos are so we'll keep an eye on that as the race develops as we see here we've got Chris Little around about 20 seconds behind this front group of four I don't think he did that well in the last race that we covered when there was a bit of a climb did he Riley he, he was off the front of that off the back of that front group Are they, uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember now maybe he did come back a little bit he, he, he certainly didn't drift all the way back did he no, he's, he's a very persistent rider, Chris. I think um, you've, you've seen that he's dropped off that front group there, but um, I think you'll find that that gap will stay fairly constant for him. Um, he's going to keep on going and putting the effort in um, and, and pushing as, as hard as he can. I don't think he will he'll drop too much further back. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that gap over the course of the climb. We'll see what happens with this front group of four, whether that starts to break up once they get onto that climb proper. They are not far off now, I'd say about one, one and a half kilometres from the foot of that climb. And that's when we'll really start to see who these best riders are. Hey, Hello, Chris, Chris how are you doing? Want... Thanks for... <laughs> I'm a fantastic, glad you're watching, Kate. Just going back on his past results, Chris had finished fourth in um, stage seven, and he'd also managed a fifth in stage six. So he is always up there, there and thereabouts. Yeah, he's been pretty consistent the last four races. He's had four top tens, so he's been working his way up that leaderboard. So yeah, if you are watching, either on uh, YouTube or on the Facebook stream, then please do drop us a message, show some support for the riders, ask us a question, and we can uh, flash that up on the screen, and we will try and answer it the best we can. Just a final little bit of descending now into the valley, a little bit of flat, and then we'll start the climbing proper. Going up Mount Etna. Looks like they're getting some speed up just there. See that they've got 330 watts there. That's a decent level of power, and Tim's got most of the riders sitting on his wheel there as he's just chugging away, dragging them all across this flatter section. Um, you've got to wonder whether some of those riders are, are just judging this to use all of Tim's energy, use his draft, and then when the climb starts proper, push on past him and, and uh, take the win. I was going to make a reference to today's Tour de France stage then about sitting on and maybe trying for the win, but I don't, don't want to give any spoilers away to anyone who's not watched it yet. So. Uh... I'll keep you dumb about that. <laughs> but no spoilers for that. 
Yeah, yeah no, of course, Riley. <laughs> I know that you're about five days behind, so you'll still be watching it in August. <laughs> There's no good TV in August, so I've got to, got to save something to watch. <laughs> Just going back to uh, that comment there about Tim. Watch me watch League Rats here. You can just see the little coloured bar under their names as we switch to Noble. Both of them currently showing yellow. So that's around about sort of 80 to 90 percent effort, just dropping down to green there. And when we were watching that little group, I noticed that Steve Cook's bar was red, and the other three guys were blue and green, which indicates that they weren't putting out much effort at all. And like you said, Riley, they were perhaps just coasting in his wheels there, enjoying a bit of draft whilst Tim was on the front, just uh, hammering it out. So uh, keep an eye on that, it might be a good tactic by Tim just to keep the pressure on, keep the power on, just ride his own race. Or maybe those other riders are just being smart, staying in behind him for a little bit longer, knowing that they uh, need to save their energy for the climb. Just sitting in on Jason Goldberg there for a second and He's been a common rider in the WKG Snapdragon events, which are a Friday night event. Um, they're kind of like a, an elimination race. Uh, usually happens around a, a, a crit circuit, a shorter crit circuit where the riders get eliminated every every lap or two, um, or if they get overtaken, they get eliminated. Um, great little fun event, quite often the name's quite good actually, Snapdragon, because it's at the generally quick, sharp events. Um, good for sprinting legs. You have to just try and make those efforts every time to stay on the bunch, cross the line. Yeah, they're good fun, those elimination races. I don't think there's any other platform that has something similar. But you really do have to be on your toes. You can quite easily get caught out at the back and suddenly find yourself off the back and uh, out of the race. It can happen in an instant. We're um, just starting at the base of Mount Etna now. It's where the, the fun riding is going to start and probably start to see some distance in be between the riders as they going up these gradients. Um, Mount Etna has erupted, erupted every 1.7 years. Did you know that, Mike? Possibly not a hill <laughs> I'd like to put it up. That is not a hit. Not something I knew. I did not realise it was uh, quite so frequent as that. I think if I saw that happening, I'd be turning around and heading back downhill as quick as possible. Which, looking at the gradient, would probably be quite quick. <laughs> Yeah, it won't be too hard to run away from that. Just seen a little bit of a change of tempo at the front here. Tim has taken uh, a little bit of a drop back there. He's noticed he's losing a bit of the group, put his power on there, trying to catch back in. Um, Oystensen, the Team 3R rider on the lead there, just keeping the power steady and it's a bit of distance into Tim there and I wonder whether this is going to be the, the continuation as he goes up the climb that this gapping will in, increase. Yeah, interesting that he's leaving his teammate behind there both riding for Team 3R. So uh, at the moment he's distancing his teammate setting the pace on the front although he's allowed Usselmans to come through now he looks like he's going to be stretching the pace a little bit. Once the gradients are increasing like this, you're not going to be having a benefit of teammates. So there's not going to be a great deal of draft. Maybe between one and ten watts if, you, if you've got your avatar positioned really neatly behind the lead rider's wheel. Um, it is just going to come down to how much power you can produce as a rider. There's also the psychological benefit though, so just having a teammate there for, for moral support, a little bit of assistance. I guess it's not quite as uh, important as real life where maybe you'd need to swap bikes or lend a wheel or something like that. But uh, yeah, we can see here this, looking, this view 
looking back down the road, Tim is uh, now eight seconds behind, that gap slowly increasing. So it goes out into the, the distance there. Yaros there coming to the front now. And we can see there, look, Mount Etna rising up in the distance. Not sure it's quite as green as that in real life. This is uh, the Magic Road skin on RGT. So it does just apply a sort of uniform, slightly random grassy vegetated texture. So we will see some of the cliffs as we get a little bit higher up. So Tim's just riding his own race here. That gap's sort of steady-ish, eight, ten seconds now. Not going out too quickly. He's sitting pretty at the top of the overall leaderboard. So he's got a little bit of room to play with here. Yeah, you've got to start asking the question now, is this over-enthusiasm by this front group? Are they egging each other on and um, burning the matches too early on in the ride? And is Tim being just a little bit more sensible and, and riding to his heart rate, riding to his power values that he knows he can achieve all the way to the top? Um, he may just start egging these guys in once the climb starts proper and they, they start feeling the pain and the lactic starts building. They might find that they're They've left themselves wanting, and Tim just motors back up and past them. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that's something that Chris Little's very good at as well. I was just pacing his climb, not getting suckered into a bit of a mano man action, and knowing, you know, a bit of bravado where you try and just hang on to that front group and you're digging a bit deep and you've still got 12, 15 kilometers to go. So uh, we could see. Like Tim, we could see Chris coming back at these guys a little bit later on. Because once you blow up, it's very easy just to be completely gone then and find any sort of pace again. You really do need to know your own rhythm, your own tempo. And it looks like Oystenson here. Maybe he's just realised that, just dropped back a little bit from Yarosh and Husselmans. He was a, did have a red bar under his name. He's just eased up a little bit to orange. So maybe just kicking it back a notch. And he's still got 16 kilometers of the race to go. Whilst we look at these front two, I have been, I've been checking in on some uh, other events, Riley. So uh, not sure if you've seen, but there's a new ride that's just uh, come up on RGT. There's a new challenge road where you can uh, ride for the yellow jersey. Uh, sponsored by Tisset, who are the official timers of the Tour de France. So it's a road that you can jump on any time, always available. It's the uh, Chase the Yellow Road. It's about 30 kilometres long and it finishes up the Planche de Belfi, the, uh, the climb where uh, Chris Froome famously beat Bradley Wiggins in a, well, I want to say 2012, don't quote me on that. It's going back a few years. So uh, yeah, you can go on there, set a time. And if you complete the course, then uh, you've got five days of which to set a time, and uh, a lucky winner will be picked at random to win a Tissot watch at the, uh, at the end of that five day period. So check it out, it's on the app, go into the events section. And I did notice that Paul Poodle was in there this evening. He's uh, been a regular in these Team 3R Sicily races, but has uh, not taken part today. So it's obviously a race that he's looking to drop and we'll focus on the riders that we've got on the race. Yes, um, it does allow you this ride format to have that little bit of flexibility to pursue an alternative ride. And um, you're not totally locked into covering every single ride in the series. And if you don't cover them, you've lost. It just gives you that little bit of flexibility to, to have a life outside of cycling and to have other things happen, but still be able to be competitive, which I think is a great format for the, the racing. It, we aren't all able to, to just drop everything and, and race all the time at a time that suits us. We've, we've all got things going on in our lives. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great way of Derek set it up. It's Derek Bucock from Team 3R who's arranged this series. Um, organized the routes and shepherded it, produced it, um, 
advertised it on all the platforms. So it's been great. Uh, Samir Dolatli has also been helpful in, in providing the actual GP axes to, to make these smooth and accurate roads, uh, make them true to life. Yeah, there's some very good Magic Road Makers. Samir is one of them. So uh, we're just going to have a little look at the, the route profile. We've got about halfway through this race now. So uh, let's have a little recap and have a look at what we've got still to come up the road during the second half of this race. Oh, we can see it starts to get a bit more twisty, zigzagging up the, the edge of the volcano there, right up to the top, topping out at 5,900 feet. It's around about 1,800 meters in metric. So we're now around about halfway. We should see the yellow banner marking that point very soon on the road. There's Fusselmunds and Yarosh here still pretty much level pegging it's holding each other within a few bike lengths of each other there we go there's the yellow arch yellow arch signifying that halfway stage it's taking them around about 24 minutes of course they did have a nice downhill section to start so uh, Probably be looking at half an hour, 35 minutes for the second half. These guys seem to be making a, a good go of it. They're certainly not dawdling up this climb. Massive number of hairpins to come up this climb. Um, if it were a flatter race, that would be something that would animate it somewhat. Because as you go through the hairpins, the, the sharper corners, RGT scrubs your speed and also uh, reduces the amount of draft effect but when you're on a gradient like this you, your draft effect is already massively reduced and you can't reduce your speed a great deal more so the hairpins tend not to have as much effect there is still some effect from them <clears throat> can also uh, be a, a slightly higher gradient as you go through the hairpins and it's a good point if you've got it in the legs it's a good point to just kick on there and break the spirit of the, the rider that's chasing you if you can just open up even a five meter gap from one of the riders behind you and they can see that you're moving away it can just be enough for them to think oh well i'm not going to catch them i'll ease up on the effort yeah those hairpins can be sort of one of two ways can't they they can either be like you mentioned a little bit steeper kicking up above the average gradient maybe 10 11 12 percent well, sometimes depending on how these these roads are made or built in real world they can just flatten out a little bit and if you're going along at a steady pace and suddenly the the gradient drops that resistance drops you can find yourself losing a little bit of speed as it eases off depends of course what your your trainer settings are so uh, you've got the slope control on the on the app and you can change that feedback intensity so if you've got it set at 100 percent it will completely mimic what the gradient is on the road but if you reduce it down to say 25% then uh, that's only gonna give you the resistance of a quarter of what's showing as the gradient so that also that's has an impact on how these riders might feel those corners and how their resistance and thus their output responds as well as we're talking there Mike there's been a development on the race there it looks like Hulselman's has perhaps just as we were saying broken the spirit of your rush behind him uh, there's a gap opening up there and it's opening up quite rapidly back to your rush um, I'd say probably about 10 seconds looking at the screen there your rush is putting his effort in he's going up to amber on his chart there and um, showing he's putting in quite a lot of effort up to red now and pushing hard to try and close that gap down up to Hulselman's um, whether he will oh Yarosh is just locked up. I don't know whether he's having a technical or whether that difference has been enough for him to give up. We'll see whether he's, oh, he's started going again. Just slowly winding Maybe up. Just a, yeah, could have just been a momentarily 
lip or a bit of a dropout. Hopefully that's not what caused the initial separation there. It does look like Pusselmans did just increase the pace and managed to pull away from Yarosh. But it does show how far ahead they were that our third place rider hasn't quite caught up with them just yet. You can't see him in the background there, so these two must have been cracking on a little bit. Boystenson, still can't see him there, so uh, these two have a healthy little lead. Yarosh is back underway and giving out good power there. I wonder whether he had a chain drop. Obviously, we, we're, most of us are using real bikes on our turbo trainers, um, so we're not immune to mechanicals in real life as well as the virtual mechanicals that you get from technical issues. Um, so I wonder whether he was just changing down into the little ring or something there and it had a little bit of chain slip. Um, but oh, no, no, as we're watching him, he's stopped again there. Yeah, it seems to be maybe a sort of a connection issue there, the way his power numbers are jumping around a little bit. And now we can see Oystenson has overtaken him and, and taken that second place on the road. Seems to be quite a big gap back from him, so there's a little bunch of three a little bit further down the road. Back to Tim Cook and here. And we see that Steve Noble's overtaken Tim. Tim's dropped back into fourth place. So Both of these guys have overtaken Yarosh. Tim perhaps not uh, conserving his energy as we thought earlier. He's just uh, perhaps not a keen fan of the, the long drawn out climbs. And that's something this series does present these different challenges it's not all about flat races you know like the Tour de France or the Giro d'Italia there's sprint stages hilly stages climber stages so uh, you need to be good at all of them if you want to win but there will be some some days which suit you better than others and possibly today it's not a day for Tim Cook but saying that fourth place so he's got Goldberg here just coming up behind him even fifth place you know that's still a a good day by anyone's standards <laughs> so uh, yeah let's not write him off just yet now Goldberg is putting in the efforts there his, his power is up at yellow um, well orange approaching red now I think you can see Tim as a target in the distance and knowing how Tim's performed in the rest of the series Goldberg's probably thinking if I can get past him that that's a good performance for me um, Tim, perhaps he's now considering this as a, a race that he may scrub and just going to ride it to the end but conserve his energy looking for future races. Yeah, it looks like this could be a, a good result for Jason Goldberg, a rider that's done a lot of the Snapdragon events, the eliminations, and also some of the Omnium events. So obviously more used to doing some of those shorter, sharper races. But here he is putting in a, a good effort on this longer, more steady climb, showing that he's capable of that as well. And here's Chris Little. Looks like he's got lead breaths coming up behind him. Here at the moment, on the road, Oystenson is in second and Liebrecht's in seventh, means that Oystenson's going to be leapfrogging him in the overall leaderboard. Jumping up into second place by the looks of it. So the final leaderboard will have to wait for all ten results and then see which of the eight best results for each rider. So it's all still to play for. Back with Perdon here, Alexander Perdon. And in a nice consistent effort, 180 watts. Quite a steady heart rate. 
can see that the speed on these gradients is much lower. They're only putting out 13.5 kilometers per hour. Eased it up a little bit there to 15 kilometers per hour, but um, not not a not a very fast pace when you start going up the hills. So this is also first time ranked event for Alexander Perdin, a bit like Scott Yarosh. A chance for him to score some ranking points. So the ranking points are only on certain events, and it's all kept track of on the rgtbb.com website. So you start off as a silver rider, and then if you beat other riders, you can move up to gold or platinum status. And uh, you can also drop down to bronze status as well if you uh, are getting beaten at silver. So hopefully you find your level and then that will allow you to enter events which may be only bronze or silver rated and give you a chance to ride against other people at your level, giving you a fun competitive race. So that it's not a case of just falling off the back of the, the pack every time because those races will exclude those, those very fast riders. Boniver is above Birch there. And you wonder whether Birch is going to catch him now. He's, he's just doing a steady ride. Um, looking like he's slowly closing the gap onto Boniver there. It's still a decent ride for Birch. Looking at his past results, he does have a 19th place from week two. So uh, today's a Today's ride could be one of his top eight results. And actually, he's just closing the gap here on Bonneville, so that'll be a ninth place. So that'll be a little improvement for him as well. Just looking back on Bonneville's previous results, he tends to do group rides or, or um, less competitive riding. So, not entirely sure he's rode this as as part of the series to. Um, to compete, I think he may have just been riding this as a fun ride, something to occupy his time more than, than something to, to win, if you will. Well, it's good to see that he's giving it a go though, something a bit different for him, might just be feeling a bit more confident after a few group rides, working up that fitness, that stamina. I thought maybe I'll give it a go today, see how he gets on. Definitely, it's always worth the ride. Better on your bike than uh, on the couch. <laughs> yeah. You're already winning if you're on your bike. You're beating everyone who's sat on the couch, that's very true. The great shots with Oi Stenson there. Just... Great shot with Oi Stenson there, the helicopter shot, just showing how the graphics are created in the, the drop offs of the cliffs. Goldberg giving away from the camera. Yeah, must be watching this, the live stream. Always useful just to see how far ahead some of the other riders are. But he's, uh, we saw him earlier, didn't we? Just behind Tim Cook, overtaking him. And now he's overtaken Noble as well. And he's got himself up into third place on the road. He's got 600 metres up to Oystenson. So uh, still got 11 kilometres to go. Might have a chance of closing that gap, but we'll see how that develops. Might be just a bit too far now. There's some nine percent gradients here. Goldberg's still got one point three kilometers to the leader there on the on the road, but um, I think he's got a good chance of reeling in second place. Also looks like he's to a certain degree woken up Steve Noble there, who's just putting in a little bit more effort. Um can quite often being passed by a rider can quite often change your tempo and and can give you give you a little bit more grit, a little bit a little bit of an urge to reach deeper and, and find energies that you didn't realise that you had to make you uh, make you get back up there. Looks like Goldberg's responding there. His bar's just gone yellow. He's, uh, making sure he's keeping that position on the road. I mean, maybe effort to catch Noble. He doesn't want to give it up too easily, if at all.
Good to hear the crowds out and about this, this high up the mountain. And it looks like that gap just is increasing a little bit now back to Noble. Goldberg not going to let himself be caught there and is pushing on to try and catch Boysonson up the road. Yeah, some great riding by Goldberg. Looks like Team 3R might be uh, dropping everybody off the podium at this rate, which they won't be happy about. It was a great shot then with the road snaking up. It's a little bit steeper than I thought it was going to be this course. We've got back to Goldberg, he's on a 5% section, but when we're on Oystenson there, 600 metres up the road, it does kick up a little bit to 8-9%, so Goldberg's got that coming in a second or so. Mount Etna has been used in the Giro d'Italia on a few occasions. Uh, back in 1967 it was used in a 170 kilometer stage. I would have liked to have attacked Mount Etna after riding 170 kilometers. Now, I think they used it a bit more recently than that as well because uh, I've got a feeling Vincenzo Nibali has a win up Mount Etna. I think they started in Sardinia a couple of years ago, is that right? Most recent use was 2017, and it was a uh, Jan Plank that won that. But it was also used back in 2011 when Alberto Contador took the stage win, and he also took the Maglia Rosa on the day. So it's, it's featured quite heavily in the, well, featured quite importantly in the Giro. Two thousand seventeen, yeah, I think it was quite early on, wasn't it? In the, the Giro that year. Your memories if you're reading what? that. <laughs> Your memory's better than mine. I don't know, I might have just made that up. <laughs> we'll go with my it. own little research now. <laughs> Just getting some information on the screen there. Um, we have a, a new event coming up, with, which is the uh, Aikige, which is um, a seven-day event. One week, the events will, will go every evening. Um, it's going to be alongside the Olympics, um, the Olympic week. Uh, it should be a great series of events. We'll be covering every single one of those from the 25th to the 31st of July. Nice feature of the Aiki guy is that they're actually incorporating several of the established events from RGT. So um, there should be great turnout in numbers for those events as well. Mountain Goats on the, the Wednesday, for instance, uh, the Tuesday night track on the Tuesday. Um, great, great events already being brought into one massive super event. It's one super series for that week of Tokyo Olympics week. Yeah, that's certainly going to be a good week of racing. It's a number of events there, road race, Omnium, time trial, mountain climbing as well. Yeah, great to see all those organisers getting involved. And I will be riding in a few of those races and we'll be bringing you live coverage. But before then, I will just go back and say, yeah, 2017, it was a 181 kilometer stage. It was stage four. The, the Giro had started on the isle, island of Sardinia and they transferred across to Sicily and they had the finish on Mount Etna. They're 19 kilometers at a 6% gradient average. And 
Uh, that really was a, an early mountain test for the Giro. You don't often get such big mountain climbs in the first week of the Grand Tours, so uh, it did shake things up a little bit. And as you said, Riley, it was uh, Jan Polank who uh, took the win that day, 20 seconds ahead of Ilna Zakharin and Garant Thomas led the uh, chasing peloton. Well, it wasn't much of a peloton. GC favourites taking third place. Quintana was 11th that day. You know who won the Giro that year, Riley? Any guesses? The, uh, the answer is no. Your, your memory is obviously <laughs> far superior from than mine, and with a uh, with data in front of you, well as well, I'm not even going to try. <laughs> well, I did uh, did have a little look, but uh, if I tell you it was Tom de Moulin, that might bring back some memories of that tour for you. Oh, I remember, yeah. So that must Obviously have been, that must have famous. been. He had the Tom de Moulin. He had the Tom de Moulin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had a, a, a very rapid um, dismount of the bike on that day. Yeah, that was in the final few days. He had to then time trial himself back up into the, the front pack managed to just do enough and then hold off Quintana in the final time trial. But yeah, almost threw it all away because of some dodgy energy gels or so the story goes. Not sure any of these riders have got that issue. Obviously if you're training indoors you can at least find a proper toilet hopefully within the 10 metres or so of your bike. <laughs> oh well, no, bottom is stopping maybe. <laughs> We maybe he's taking a toilet break. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, cut the cameras away. You don't need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, going back to the, the riders on the road there. We, um, Alexander Perdon, it looks like it's his first ranked race on RGT. Um, I have managed to find a rider on Strava who has just Looks like they've just started riding RGT. They're, they're quite a frequent rider in real life. Uh, 103 kilometers average a week and uh, over four hours a week on the bike. So I think third on, once they've got used to the platform, they probably will be a, quite a, an accomplished cyclist. Uh, they get used to the platform and get the legs. Yeah, there are those little nuances of the platform, understanding the draft and the way the corners work, it is different to riding outside. Don't need to worry about that handling quite so much. It is a, a discipline in itself, though. The course runs nine kilometres from the top. Then you can see it, the mountain there, stepping up, zigzagging up in front of him. Sometimes it can be a bit demoralising when you just see those cliffs in front of you stepping up, on and on into the distance. I do personally find courses with hairpins uh, much easier to ride. I can I can set myself a goal of a target to, to hit the hairpin, and it's achievable. Um, breaks down into bite-sized pieces. Then, when you've got a long straight road in front of you, I find that, find that much more demoralising than the hill climbs. Personally, yeah, it's good mental checklist, isn't it? Some people use lamp posts in real life, trees, oh, just keep going to that next tree, right onto the next one, and yeah, like you say, hairpins, that's another little good, just mental checklist there, onto the next one, reset, onto the next one. And I've got quite a few more to go on this climb, so I'm sure they'll be checking them off for a little while yet. Paul Sullman's just around about 300 watts there, going up the the hill, um, Oystenson, 270 watts. They're putting out some decent power going up this climb. I mean, you have to put out a decent power to go this climb. Oystenson, quite a lower cadence there at 65, 63. Um, cadence tends to drop as you're going up a, a climb. Obviously, if you, you're looking at the pros, they 
would intend to climb everything optimum cadence thought to be around about 90 um, obviously quite often your amateur rider will be lower than that in general and will drop considerably going up climbs And yeah, Jason Goldberg here down at 55 to 65 RPM. That's quite low, I suggest, but obviously it depends on the gearing on his bike. Perhaps you might want to just look at that slope setting I talked about earlier, just drop that down a little bit to make it a little bit easier. More spinning rather than grinding, but different different folks like have different styles, so uh, Maybe that's just what he's used to and what he enjoys. I think quite often riders coming from the mountain bike discipline tend to have a lower cadence when they're climbing um, or just a lower cadence in general. It's not as much of a, a repetitive endurance sport, the mountain biking, so I think you can get away with it more easily. Um, ideally, the, the higher cadences for the road bike, I, I believe, is because of the endurance effect and it helps to clear lactic and put generally a lower strain on the muscles for longer, more sustained efforts. Yeah, lots of, lots of little efforts with the higher cadence rather than slightly longer but more intense efforts with that lower cadence. So Chris Little still sitting comfortably by the looks of it in sixth place here. Seem to have uh, made too much movement in the GC there. So he's keeping lead breaths just behind him. They're, they're not too far apart on the road, I don't think. But he's not quite yeah, able to gain. You know, we discussed earlier on, Chris, just nice solid riding there. He's not going to be blast into the front of the field but by the same respect he's he's going to be a, a good position in the in the race and quite often just getting those solid positions time and time again can be what adds up to a good placing in the overall series yep sometimes consistency is key on these longer series Not always beneficial to yo-yo between podiums or in 25th place. Fairly low heart rate there for Gary Birch, but I know that heart rate is very much a, an individual thing. I think my heart rate would be up around 170 at this stage. So I think my heart rate tends to be a bit higher than other people. Unfortunately, it does look like Bonivere is abandoned there. They've not restarted. Um, sometimes you do get a little break with a rider who's perhaps forgotten the water bottle and has run off to, to get a new water bottle or refill it. Um, it looks like Bonivere has finished their ride there. Regardless, it's, it's good effort from them. They've um, put in a bit of, bit, of a, uh, bit of a turn there to get themselves that far along in the race. Yeah, we did mention, didn't we, looking at their past history, that they've not done many races. They, they tend to do group rides, so possibly they were just looking for a 45-minute effort and that was their time slot for the day. That's how far they got in that time and now they've just knocked on its head because they've got other plans. Holselman's making a more of a, a difference there at the front. He's, he's gone out. 1.98 kilometers from Goldberg who we're following at the moment he's got uh, about 1.2 kilometers over Roy Stinson, who's in second place he's hitting fairly consistently about 3.5 watts per kilogram or more um, don't know how much Holzman's weighs but I have a feeling that he may end up getting disqualified from this race again that that does look like he's going to be on the cusp I have to look at that and the results later. Yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, the only good thing I guess we can can say is that hopefully he's not had too much of an impact on the race itself because 
he's off the front on his own, so he's not dragging anyone along with him. Not putting anyone in the red too much. But it did look like between second and third from Eistensen's back to Goldberg has increased slightly that gap. It was around about 600, now it's 750 metres. Slowly increasing, but not any rapid rate. And from Goldberg back to Noble, that was around about 20 metres when we checked in a couple of kilometres ago. And that has now increased to about 120 metres. So you can see the two riders there on the road, or on Noble, you can just see up around that bend, there's Goldberg. So he's still just about in sight. And you can just see there on top of the cliff, that was Noble, and Tim Cook's just down the around the hairpin, out of sight, 200 metres down the road. Not done just yet. Might be saving himself for a bit of a sprint later on. Still putting in a good bit of effort there, Tim Cook. He's going to be, well, we would expect him to stay away from Chris, Chris Little at this point. Um, Steve Noble, maybe he'll catch him. Um, as you say, there's, Tim's got good good history in this race, um, in this series, so he may just catch up to Noble there, giving it a steady ride. There's um, something I've noticed in the in this race, Mike, I don't know you can help me with. Obviously, Tim Cook there is wearing the Team 3R kit as a Team 3R rider. Um, Alexander put on there, he's wearing a different kit. And there's a couple of other kits in the, in the race that I didn't recognise. Do you know who they belong to? Um, I can't quite remember what kits they were, so... Uh... I'm not sure if our producer can switch back to Perdon and a couple of the other riders so we can have a look. Uh, but yeah, Tim put there in the 3R kit. And uh, Isenson as well, Ray, he was also in that 3R kit. So here we are then, Perdon rider box. Yeah, not sure. That's not one I'm familiar with. I know there's been a lot of events on RGT and often those off the back of those events, extra kits get put back into the game. Could be uh, one of the pro teams that were riding in the Echelon series or in the BC Cup, which is the, the British Columbia Cycling Cup. So often, yeah, off the back of those sort of events, new kits are added. There's a lot in game. The rider box, yeah. And you can see there a few extra sponsor names there. Laser, obviously, yeah. Uh, brand with helmets etc getting right up in the uh, <laughs> the back side of this rider here I'm not sure they're going to appreciate that <laughs> almost ready to give them a virtual push oh I do recognize this kit this, this is a this is what you actually racing. racing yeah that's right this is the bio racer kit uh, I quite like it just because it's a bit funky with the colors different colors different patterns easy to spot when on the road when you're trying to spot your avatar in the bunch because I do ride in the third person view and that's quite good for keeping an eye on where I am on the road makes it easier to spot in the pack and give me a better field of view to see what's happening with other riders as well so it's because of the way this is virtual it allows the camera to be positioned a little bit different if I was in the real world of course I'd be first person view and not able to see around me quite so easily so it does give you a little bit of a benefit when you're online oh this is a this is the little 500 kit so this is a race uh, from america as well uh, which is covered a very, a very apt kit then for uh chris little yes i wonder if that's the reason he's chosen it <laughs> yeah it could be could be uh, so I think this is a race that's actually sponsored by one of the state universities in, in America. And of course there's the 3R kit. Ride, race, ride, raise and race I think is what the 3Rs are. Um, I know that they're sort of a partner club with World Bicycle Relief, which is the, the worldwide charity that raises money to purchase bicycles for people in disadvantaged areas. 
So uh, Lachlan Morton, you might have seen he's just done his alt tour, riding all of the Tour de France stages. He's just raised around about half a million dollars for World Bicycle Relief. So that's uh, a huge sum of money for them. That's a great number. That's thousands of bikes that's going to purchase for, for them, which they'll be able to send out to people in need and have them cycle to school, cycle to work, and just generally uh, help improve their lives. It's also the charity that RGT supports, isn't it? Um, and they did an event for it a little while back. It was very interesting to, to know how much of a difference that you think a bike would be, I don't know, kind of a strange thing to be giving away. But when they started drilling down about, like you say, children's ability to get to school and get educated, but then also in districts where um, cars aren't as frequent, of getting deliveries to people, moving medicines, equipment around, doctors themselves and nurses being able to travel from village to village and all of a sudden this kind of innocuous mode of transport that we kind of take for granted and as a, a luxury and a, a relaxing sport for ourselves is something that's really important to those people and, and makes a big difference to their lives. Yeah absolutely it really does help make the world a, a more accessible place if you think if you were walking for an hour maybe do six or seven kilometers but on a bike you could do 20 25 kilometers so it really does make school work food much more accessible so yeah really great charity to support and uh, there are a lot of events on rgt which help raise awareness of that just yes, quickly nipping back to the jerseys um there were quite a few that I didn't recognise there. Though. It's quite often asked on the Facebook pages about how you get your jersey in-game. Um, so it's something that RGT is quite individual about. There's not a lot of platforms out there that will allow you to get your jersey in-game. Um, and it's not that that easy to do for a lot of the other platforms. RGT can do it. Um, it is limited though. Generally it's for clubs who've got mass participation. If you have a, a club that's got hundreds or thousands of members that are going to ride on RGT, they may consider putting the jersey in the game for you. Um, the other way, if you've not got as many members or um, as much participation in the virtual world, is to get yourself into one of the ranked competitions that gets run. Um, so I think, as, as Mike was saying before, the, the um, Echelon League, they've got lots of smaller clubs who've got riders that get into that league and you can get the jerseys into the game in that manner. Um, it gives you a lot of variation in what you can wear in-game. You, you're not stuck with one basic kit. You've got a lot of choices. Make your character more individual and more, like Chris Little has done with a little 500 top, maybe a, a bit more personalised. I think it's clear that Goldberg is watching the stream there as we're going along. Thanks for waving. I wonder what the three pluses after his name means. Three wins, perhaps. Three World Cups. <laughs> we better not distract him here, or he might start getting caught by our fourth place rider. We need him to focus and try and catch Oystenson. See if that gap's coming down. Looks like Oystenson's just about to hit a slightly orange section you can see in the gradient below there the larger white dot that indicates that we're following Oystenson the other white dots that are much smaller that's the the other riders on the course but you can just see how that gradient now will it's been pretty dark red but it's going to be orange for a little section and that's just indicating that the gradient's easing off a little bit that'll be sort of four or five percent for the, the medium orange there and then a little bit further up the road you can see there's some sort of yellowy sections so that's sort of three percent this is where the swimmer's just come off, he's on a little 5% section, it's going to level up again a little bit. And then right at the end you can see the green section where it's, it's flat. Yeah, well, you're sensing there, just enjoying a little bit of a break from that persistent gradient when you're riding at 
eight nine percent for so long dropping down to four percent it feels flat can also be a little bit harder to keep the power down consistently because you are changing gear to try and get that sweet spot again and then almost as soon as you've got it as Oystenson is going to find now you're back into the gradient again changing gears again trying to find that rhythm again yeah exactly you can really knock your rhythm as you jump between those different gradients but yeah even four percent can feel like a bit of relief once you've uh, been riding at eight percent for a while it also means you might just drop off a bit too much whereas you might be doing 300 watts on the, the steeper sections suddenly you're riding at 200 watts then you, your pace eases off and you can find yourself actually losing a little bit of time and that gap closing to the riders behind because you you ease off a little bit too much just caught up with Holsenman's there he's he's quite far in front he's on the amber level so again he's on a, a larger section of four or five percent gradient um, you can see his power it dropped right down he was only in the blue blue bar um, easing off but he, he was very far in front nipping back to Goldberg now he's not too far away from Oystenson My bad there, it's a, it's a 1.8 kilometre gap. I was looking at the map at the back. He's, he's got quite a big distance back to Oystenson there. Yeah, that gap's increased and he's, he's pulled away from Noble a little bit. But there it looks like the gap between Noble and Cook is only 100 metres or so, so it might be an opportunity for Cook to come back and overtake Noble, gain an extra point on the road. Unfortunately, Riley, I'm going to have to leave you there. Uh, this race I was not quite expecting to, to last. So, uh, yeah, caught me out a little bit. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I'm going to have to abandon you and uh, you'll have to fly solo for the, the final few kilometres. Uh, thanks for no tuning problem, in, everyone. Mike. And I will... Yeah, sorry about that. And I will catch you soon. And I'm sure we'll be covering some other races soon. Actually, we'll be covering the Ratio race on Monday again, so uh, look out for that one, 6.30 on Monday. But for now, I'm going to leave you in the very capable hand of Riley, who's going to see this race home. Good job you weren't racing this one then, Mike. You'd have been an abandon as well. Well, I think I would have been a DQ. <laughs> I'd have, I'd have finished 10 minutes ago just to make sure that I could uh, go get my dinner. <laughs> well, this is fantastic now. You can see Tim has caught sight of Noble again on this hairpin. He's putting in the effort to catch back up to Noble. And I think we're going to see an interesting battle between fourth and fifth here. Um, we'll see how much power Tim has kept in reserve. We thought he was going slightly easier on the lower slopes. Um, pacing himself and I think that could be true now he's, he's getting in 250 watts and just closing that gap to Noble Noble potentially not able to react here or he might not have seen the danger um, keeping his power green which means he's riding just below his FTP in a, in a comfortable zone um, but Tim his avatar up out of the saddle and he's putting the effort in to bring him back in heart rate's going up to 166 Noble, a slightly lower heart rate there, he's running at 153. As Mike said, heart rate is an indicator for yourself and the effort that you're putting in, not necessarily the same for every rider on the road. Um, some riders can ride quite comfortably at 140 uh, an effort and some riders will be riding the same sort of 
terrain and, and hitting 170, even 180, um, very personal. But if you're looking at the same rider and you see the heart rate skyrocketing, you can tell that they're putting the effort in. Speeds are only about 10 kilometers per hour here on these slopes. A noble, slightly higher cadence than some of the other riders we've seen. Um, selected a more suitable gear perhaps, or, or maybe just reduced the gradient through the RGT app to allow himself to spin a bit more freely. That slope intensity can be a lifesaver if you've if you've a bike that's built for the lowlands um, and would probably use a different gear ratio when you're climbing something like Mount Etna. You can use the built-in slope intensity to uh, virtually increase your gear range. Um, it doesn't change the amount of effort that you have to put in, the amount of watts that you have to put in to climb, but it can just effectively give you those bigger 28 converted into a 32 or up to a 34, for instance, on the, the rear cassette, just to allow you to spin a bit more freely. Tim there putting in a slight effort, bringing his power up over 300 watts. Um, you can see Noble there. Noble's power has dropped again. I wonder whether Noble's just allowing him to catch here so we can watch him. And they'll take this race all the way to the finish line. It could be that Noble has hit one of those points. He's tried to keep Tim away and just found that he can't. Tim's passed. We'll see that Noble puts in an effort to jump on the wheel and keep the, pay keep the uh, distance there controlled. No, it's looking like Noble can't put in that kind of effort to keep Tim on the leash. Tim's just breaking free there, increasing the gap. Noble's heart rate's dropped even slightly more than it was before when we last looked at him. Uh, wonder whether he's just controlling his losses here. He knows he's not going to be able to beat Tim and he's just going to ride this home in the position that he's got. Keep fifth. Keep a solid fifth rather than risking fourth. Tim Powell wise is up in the yellow banding there and gradually increasing his distance over Noble. Heart rate's fairly steady, it's consistent with where we saw him a few moments ago. And again, Tim's got a slightly higher cadence there between the 80s and 90s, which is generally thought to be ideal. Um, Tends to be a little bit lower on the climbing, but for reasons stated before, the, the clearing of the lactic acid and making more turns of slightly lower intensity is, is generally thought to be a little bit more forgiving on your muscles than trying to crank out massive watts on each pedal stroke, as was thought to be the, the best thing back in the 70s, early 80s. Back up with the race leader, Paul Summons here. Um, He's eased the power right down, tending to be in the green. Still playing out 250 watts ish. Um, speed of 14 kilometers per hour. No heart rate data from Holtzmann's. It's not essential that you wear a heart rate monitor, but if you are racing, it's probably recommended. It just helps to ratify the efforts that you're putting in. Um, Let's everyone know that you, when you're putting your speed up, your heart rate's going up and they, they tend to correlate. Uh, unfortunately, there are the occasional rider who might use artificial assistance to win races, which is not something anybody likes to see. Evan Oystenson back in second place here. I think it's clear that he's not going to get first on this race. Still putting in a good consistent effort, just coming out of the amber section there, the slightly lower gradients. He'll be putting on a bit more power as he starts edging towards the 9%. A good look at the Team 3R kit. Riding on a Canyon bike, I think that's a Canyon Air Road. 15 kilometers per hour, nice deep aero rims and the disc brakes. Doesn't really make much difference in the game, but it's nice to look at. Certainly a nice bike to look at in real life. Looking back behind Oysters and there, you can't see anybody else on the road. I think he's got a good 
distance to third place there. I think third place is held by Goldberg at the moment. Goldberg playing that green power there. Ravy kit, the BMC bike. Slightly less deep rims and a little bit more of a traditional design of a bike. Moving on to the disc brakes though as most of the manufacturers are. Rim brakes only favoured by Ineos in the World Tour I think this year. Goldberg above the threshold of 3.2 watts per kilogram there, he's playing out 3.4. But likely that that will average out over the entirety of the race and allow him to get in underneath the 3.2 watt per kilogram cap. Noble now just got back onto the wheel as Tim Cook. Maybe had a moment of uh, recovery as Tim Cook went past him and just got himself back into the right tempo to reel him back in. I think this might be the, the big race on the road. The other positions are looking like they're secured. Tim Cook and Noble here fighting for fourth and fifth position. This could be the one to watch as we come over the line. They're edging towards the amber section, the, the section of 4%. Toe-to-toe -to -toe battling out between them. As Noble just edges forward. As the pace changes as we go over that 4% gradient, it will be interesting to see who selects the right gear. You probably will see a little bit of a gap opening up. With these riders being what, how it would appear so closely paced at the moment, so closely matched, um, that could be the little bit of a gapping that leads to the win for them at the end. Chris Little still behind them there, 830 metres behind, with a, a good distance over his nearest competitor everything was Librex there Chris put in a steady effort see all the riders using Wahoo computers the computer I use myself in real life nice little unit can almost read his speed on that gauge crystal clear display Good battery life as well. The arrow mount. Back with Librex now. Librex at 2.2 watt per kilogram on this climb. Here in a 7.4 gradient, it's just up in there on the on the hairpin up to an 8.4. 203 watts. His heart rate of 155, keeping it steady there. Slightly lower cadence than some of the riders that we've seen further up the road. Whether that might be something that's affecting how he's performing on the course or not. Just went through one of the mile markers there with a 24, which is the distance covered. When you're racing deep, they can be a quite an important little mile marker for you it's easier to read them sometimes than looking at the head-up display that was purred on there purred on still riding strong he's the last rider on the course had some abandons today and it's great to see that he's still completing the course he's looking like he's going to go strong to the finish 2.9 watts per kilogram for a rider that's not done much on the platform so far it's a great performance as you can see he's hitting red on the power bar there which means he's above FTP um, and whenever you see a rider doing that it means that they might not be making the greatest progress on in the race but it means that they're putting in their max effort and it's great to see when a, a rider just completely commits to the race regardless of the position they're racing for themselves they're trying to win trying to make as, as good in it an attempt that they can back up with Hulsum in this he's gone through the one kilometer marker 930 meters left to go 
power bar is much lower, but he's still playing out 3.1 watts per kilogram there. Not too many bends left to go to the finish line. If we'd had a closer, closer race here, that the, these hairpins, these corners would have had an effect. It would have been a matter of judging where you put the effort in on this last running. Each one of these corners would be slowing the riders down slightly, scrubbing a little bit of the speed and affecting how they reacted with each other. The, the drafting would be affected as you're going around these bends. 17 kilometers per hour, he's still got a little bit of the gradient here. Not quite into the flatter, run into the finish. I think it's Cole Summons is a the definite winner of this race. I don't think there's any chance that anyone's going to catch him at this rate. <laughs> it's 610 meters left to go and a 1.8, 1.83 kilometer lead over Oystensen, the next rider on the road. Oystensen, Team 3 event, Team 3R event and Oystensen looking like he's going to bring second place home um, although that being said with the review after this Oystensen may find himself moved up to the top step on the podium Pulsemans consistently pushing out over four watts per kilogram uh, when the camera switched to him so Oystensen may have just put in the ride to win this Pulsemans bringing it home. 300 meters to go. And we just see the gradient flattening out. Pulsemans putting in a little bit of an effort here, standing out of the saddle. 330 watts. Has just changed gear there to uh, anticipate the reduction in the gradient. Just pushing himself up and over that gradient and putting in an effort to the line. Only 180 meters left to go. This is sprinting distance now. We'll see if he opens up with a sprint to finish. Speed's gone up to 26 kilometers per hour. Last little bit now. And there we go, sprint for the finish. Pulsemans there, comfortably over. And uh, I think race control will be taking him straight over to the doping tent there and uh, taking a sample off him, see whether he was allowable in this race. Oystensen, Team 3R, 3.2 watts per kilogram, 7.7 .7 on the gradient, lifting it up to 8.6 there momentarily. 1.9 kilometers left to go. Total climb at the moment, 1,135 meters. Still got a way to go. Finishes up at 1,280 meters. Looking at Goldberg back there in second place. Oystensen comfortable lead over Goldberg. Goldberg playing a really strong effort here though. 2.9 watts per kilogram. Strong race from Goldberg. Still got a decent gap over the next place there, Noble. Noble and Tim Cook looking like they're still in somewhat of a battle. Noble's just taken over Tim Cook and opened up just a little bit of a gapping going. Oystensen, 270 watts on the road. Slightly lower cadence, 75 cadence there. Speed's down at 9 kilometers per hour now as these gradients are really biting, 11.3 on the gradient there. Goldberg comfortable on his power, 270 watts. Green on his power bar there, which means he's just below his FTP. As we say, it's just putting in a little bit of an effort there. 16 kilometers per hour. And a nice steady heart rate, 155. 
slightly below 155. Back to what's been one of the more interesting battles on the road. We've got Noble here. Just looking behind him there. He looks like he's managed to drop Tim Cook again. Noble's putting in some efforts here. Putting his power up to 260 watts there. His heart rate's increased slightly up at 167. But this could be the decisive move that he's made here that's dropped Tim Cook. And could take him all the way to the line in fourth place. Just crossed over some of the chalk writing on the road there, one of the nice little added features of RGT. Everyone likes to see the name on the road. And RGT does it for you. There we go, Tim Cook, name on the road. A little bit of a boost there. Gives you a little bit of energy to put, put some more effort in and get you a little bit further down the road. One of the little features, not a lot of the platforms. In fact, I don't think any of the other platforms do that automatically for you. Any race that you enter, you can come across your name on the road. Just give you that little bit of extra energy and helping Tim to dig a little bit deeper there. He's playing out 350 watts for a moment there, just after he'd seen his name. Avatar standing as he puts the effort in, fighting against these gradients. 27 kilometer mile mark on the road there. Mount Etna is truly an unforgiving beast. It's been a, a real battle for these riders getting up here. Chris Little, nice and solid in sixth place there. Playing a good ride. I think he'll be happy with sixth position there. Be happier with fifth, fourth, third, but it's been a good ride for him. He's, he's really performed well. Been consistent throughout the series. Efforts there of 240 watts. Nice and steady. Slightly lower cadence. Uh, I find myself with a, a lower cadence after a while. It ties my legs. I can't pile out the power. Is, I can initially, but with a low cadence, I find that my legs get tied a little bit sooner. And I have to try and find that sweet spot over there. Higher cadence. Not, not too fast. You don't want to spin at 100 but um, certainly feel more comfortable at the 70, closer to 80 on the climbs, and more sustainable. Back to Lee Bricks here. Lee Bricks, again you can see his yellow power bar there, which means he's putting in a good effort there. Around FTP effort, 250 watts. Managing 17 kilometers on the road there, 17 kilometers per hour. Heart rate, 168. Again, seeing the heart rate compared to the, the power that the rider's putting in it, it really shows you more of the story. It shows that Lee Briggs is putting in the effort here and he's trying. Um, when you're looking back as race control and you're looking at riders on the road, you've got slight queries about, then it helps to see that the heart rate is reacting as the power is increasing, the heart rate's increasing. Well, Eastenson crossed the one kilometer marker there. The Flam Rouge, not too much more of this gradient now for Oysterson. He'll be looking forward to that relief of the flat spots. That flat running of a couple of hundred meters into the finish line. He's done his Team 3R teammates proud here. Coming in on second position on the road. 870 meters left to go for him. Going around this hairpin, gradients quite often kick up in the hairpin, it can be a little bit harder to keep the speed up through the hairpins and a bit disruptive to your rhythm. Looking forward down the road here, we're looking forward to seeing that finish line. Got a few, probably about 400 metres before we start seeing the Diminishing gradient before it flattens out before the finish line. Um, Oystenson keeping the power on here, keeping it steady. Don't think there's any concerns about getting taken, overtaken by third place. Um, although it looks on the road that 
the, the fight between third, fourth, and fifth is is hotting up there, further down the road. We will see Oystenson over the line here. Only 640 meters to go. As soon as he hits those flatter gradients, his speed will increase, and I'm sure he'll play in a good sprint finish. As Mike mentioned earlier on, and I mentioned myself, this is a, a row created by Samir Delatley for Derek Bucock to put on the tour of Sicily series. Um, Derek's been very thorough in organizing this series and promoting it across different platforms. Um, organizing series always takes a little bit more effort, keeping a track of everyone's position and all the points. But it's great to see that people have the time and put in the effort to do this. And the GPXs can be brought from anywhere around the world into RGT and you can create any road that you want. And we've also got quite a lot of riders and racers creating completely virtual roads, spelling out names, creating patterns in the road just to make racing interesting and different or uh, to commemorate different things as well. Oystenson, 340 metres to the line. Just seeing the distance there, the gradient is flattening off. Going to be hitting those lower gradients of... I think it's going to be dropping down to almost zero, which will be a massive relief for riders after climbing out and like that. Having the power down now, as you can see, these gradients easing off. Perhaps selecting a slightly higher gear so that when he does hit those flatter roads, he can keep the power down. 4.6 on the gradient. Just an hour and 30 into this race now. 1,277 meters climbs, only three meters left in this race. We can see the finish line. Oystenson coming in at 3.3 watts per kilogram. Only 50 meters left. Will he open up a sprint for the line? He's cruised over. No risk from the riders behind him. Nice cool down for Oystenson there before running off to the showers. Back with third position on the road, Goldberg. Jason Goldberg's been putting a consistent half in third place here. He must watch out for Steve Noble on the road. Steve looks like he's had a little bit extra in the tank and is closing slightly on him. A gap of only 138 metres, back to fourth now for Goldberg. Goldberg's been putting in a consistent effort and hope he can keep this sort of pace up to the line. Just hope he's going to keep that positioning. Noble looks like he dropped Tim Cook there, who had had an earlier battle on the road. Perhaps he's just paced himself right to, to make an effort for this third position on the road. Goldberg needs to protect that and keep putting, putting the power down if he wants to stay away from Noble. Noble there, showing a yellow bar, just dropping it down into the green. Looks like he's comfortably dropped Tim Cook there. It'd take a sprint effort from Tim, I think, to, to get back up to Noble and pass him. Noble up at 169. We were looking at him earlier on in the race. His heart rate was around about 165. Um, so he is putting in a bit more of an effort here. Hope he can sustain that all the way to the line. And perhaps he can make it just back up to Goldberg there. Jason Goldberg. And make a race for the third position. Tim Cook, another of the team, 3R racers, back there on the road. Fifth position. I think it looks like he's going to comfortably hold on to fifth position with Chris Little being the closest competitor at 700 metres behind him. Um, whether he can close that gap, which seems to be growing consistently, back to Steve Noble. Uh, it's 253 metres and, and just gradually increasing there to Steve. I don't think there's any chance he's going to make it back to fourth position. Goldberg looks like his power has dropped slightly momentarily there. Uh, getting 
gapping of around about 200 meters over Noble. Um, not too much longer in the race left for Goldberg there. Looks like he's going to come over the line in third. Unless Steve Noble has saved himself a lot of matches there and can make a sprint for the end. Goldberg can see the Flam Rouge in the distance there. That must be giving him a lot of spirit, a, a lot of a lot of uh, extra energy now. One kilometre is always an important marker in the race. You can you can smell the finish line. Hundred and sixty five watts. Goldberg has dropped down on the power somewhat since we last looked at him. Heart rate up at 160. Just coming up to the Flam Rouge there. The hashtag go beyond. RGT symbols. Great, great level of detail. We've even got the air blower keeping these air banners up in the air. We don't want anyone kicking the power cable out and someone getting trapped in the air banner line happened to Yates some years ago. Well, now we see Noble coming up on that Flam Rouge, the one kilometre marker. Will he be able to catch Goldberg just as we're coming up to the finish line? He must know how close he is. If he's got any matches, now's the time to burn them. Only going at 9 kilometers per hour, but these are steep gradients here. We're hitting about 10%. The camera doesn't always show the true gradient on these rides. Very difficult to get a good idea of, of how steep these roads are and how much effort it takes to climb them. The canyon performing flawlessly. Goldberg's power just seems to be dropping a little bit here as we're going closer towards the finish. He's got a distance of 136 metres, but only 760 metres left to go in the race, so it is unlikely that Noble's going to cover that distance and overtake him. But Noble still trying, still putting the effort in. Another wave from Goldberg there. Obviously a fan there. Making it interesting for us to the end. Great riding. Have to see whether Goldberg saving a little bit of energy up for the big sprint finish at the end. Interesting to see on that close up. We could just see Noble come into view in the distance there. A little bit closer, 140 meters, the, the gapping there. Back to Noble. Goldberg easing up. Is Goldberg just suffering a little bit of lactic acid in the legs here? Two watts per kilogram from Goldberg. He's back, back up to 2.8. He's not going to risk letting Noble catch him. 490 meters left to go to the finish. The gradient is still 6.4. That little bit of green at the end as you're coming up Mount Etna. You can't imagine how much of a relief it will be for these riders to hit that little flat spot. But then to think that you need to sprint it to the line with all your last little bits of energy to secure that position. Gaps coming down quite quickly between Goldberg and Noble here. Only 106 meters now. Noble can clearly see Goldberg in his sights. Goldberg's opened it back up again here. 2.9 watts per kilogram. He's seen the threat. He doesn't want to be caught. He wants to secure this third position. BMC bike with slightly less aero wheels. Oh, 
Noble. See tantalising Goldberg off in the distance there. I don't think there's much chance he's going to be able to catch him. Goldberg's just about to enter onto the flat section, or the flatter section. 220 metres to the finish, 200 metres. Waving at the goats as he goes. Let's see what kind of a sprint Goldberg opens up before this finish line. Hundred and thirty meters. You can see the finish line in the distance. Sixty meters. Noble now distance to 160 meters. Goldberg comes over the wave, third position. Great riding. Noble sees the distance, sees the finish line of the distance. He's done a great ride to recover from Tim Cook there. Tim Cook overtook him slightly early in the race and he managed to reel him back in and he's distanced Tim with a great ride, 570 meters. Wasn't quite good enough to pull Goldberg back in, but he did really great getting that fourth position on the road. Tim Cook, consistent throughout the series and another great ride from him. He's clear at the top of the table, but he's still putting in the effort to get a good finish here. 550 meters behind Noble, but he's got a distance of 750 over at the next ride on road, Chris Little. And he's gonna finish in a comfortable time there. Probably around about 150, one hour 50. Chris, Chris Little, you can see just over the hairpin, the next hairpin up on the hill there, the Flam Rouge, 2.7 watts per kilogram, 8.1 gradient. That with Liebrix here. Liebrix, just see Chris Little in the distance. It's not an insurmountable distance to Little here. He's got an 88 meter gap in. You may see Liebrix if he keeps on putting in the effort and reeling Chris Little back in here. Just 10.1 gradient around this apex of this band. Little kick on the hairpin. Liebrix putting down the power. 3.1 watt per kilogram. 80 meter gap there to Chris Little. Chris just about to come underneath Flam Rouge, passing the 29 kilometer marker. 1,216 meters of climbing. Still another 74 left to go before he finishes. Don't know whether Chris is just taking a, a bit of solace in the fact that he's coming underneath the Flam Rouge or whether he's noticed the danger from Liebrix behind him with a gap of only 75 metres now. He's putting in a little bit of an effort. Tim Cook rolling a steady effort in now. Liebrix power just dropping there. Maybe he selected the wrong gear. 100 metres for Tim Cook to the finish line. Rolling at home. On the flatter section, he'll be glad to be hitting that finish line. It's a one hour 42 time for him. Great time for this sort of a course. And I'm sure he'll be glad to hit the protein shake, jump in the shower, shake those muscles out. Liebrix looking like he was gonna close on Chris Little there, but his, his pass just dropped there. Don't know whether he put in the effort and just slightly misjudged the gearing as he's come through those sections. With the gaps open back up again to Chris Little. 120 meters. I find sometimes you, you can over egg it when you see a rider in the distance and you, you think you can catch them. You can just try and try and snatch at it. You can put too much power down in one go. Close, see yourself closing and, and just find that actually it's not sustainable and it all comes crashing down. You have to have a, a few moments of recalibration before going back into a steady tempo again. Evo Liebrex there, 175 watts. 
Again, speed's only nine kilometers per hour. His heart rate is up there at 171. We remember rightly when we were looking at him earlier on in the race, it was a, a little bit lower than that. 166-ish. And it looks like Chris, who's been fairly solid in that sixth position all the way through, he's going to be finishing in that sixth position. Riding a fixie up these sort of gradients, that's, uh, that's more power than I can muster. It's dedication to the cause. Perhaps that's why his cadence has been lower earlier on. 13 kilometers per hour, you can see it's just easing slightly. The gradient, his power is picking up. I think he's had a fairly constant heart rate of 155-ish all the way through this race. Just been riding to tempo, riding within himself. Keeping a consistent power, consistent pace. If you, if you know what your heart rate is, how you react to your heart rate, you can quite often do that through an entire ride. Just ride a steady pace and just keep your heart rate solid. Seeing his speeds increasing slightly, the, the gradients are just starting to tail off a little bit. Just passing Goldberg's name on the road there. Goldberg already finished, great positioning. Third place on the road. As we say, we might have doping control looking at Hulsman's position there. Nice smooth tarmac roads. This is the standard RGT skin that you can use for the magic roads. There's also available the RGT Classics Europe in Spring skin, which is a slightly less blue skies. Um, you get some cobbled roads and some puddles, the occasional rain. And something else that you can use for your magic roads just to mix it up, up a little bit, keep the interest going. You can ride the same road but with a different skin. It looks completely different. Finish line inside for Chris Little. Coming in nice and steadily, sixth position. Great riding, steady ride. Chris doing great throughout this whole series. Finish time 146 there. Back with Liebrix. Liebrix pushing 2.1 watts per kilogram. Looked like it was going to close on Chris Little a little bit earlier on in the race. Um, but Chris just kept it steady. Liebrix seemed to just falter slightly. Coming over the line at 1.7 watts per kilogram. Just this flat section. Slight descent as you come to the final section. Time of 146. 1,278 meters of climbing. That's a, a good ride for anybody. Purred on. As we were saying earlier on the ride here, I think Purred on, this is one of the first times he's rode on RGT. Uh, it's one of his first ranked races. I think it's his only ranked race. Putting in a great effort here. Got distanced by a lot of the pack earlier on. Um, some of the riders who were closer to him abandoned. And he's rode a lot of the race on his own. It can be very mentally disruptive when you're riding for that longer distance on your own. Alexander put on there, putting out 178 watts. Cadence 66. Just a slightly higher gradient as we come in round that bend there. Fairly steady heart rate at 170, uh, 157. And the speeds, this course has been probably an average of around about 11 kilometers per hour on this course for most of the riders. When there's this much elevation, you, you're not going to have high speeds. It's all about the vertical. It's all about climbing the meters. 
put on 0.3 watts per kilogram. He's certainly going to be within the, the bracket of the 3.2 watt per kilogram that this race is based on. But that's the idea of these races that someone with a slightly lower watt per kilogram can come and have competition. 660 meters to the line. Put on seeing that distance and he's, he's putting in the athlete. He's going to empty the tank all the way up to the line here. Still got 27 meters left of climbing. 5.5% slow. And I think we're going to see a big sprint finish from put on here. It's brought his speed up to about 16 and a half kilometers per hour. Gradient just increasing there to 6.5. Only 470 meters left to go, but we've still got a decent gradient all the way. That those last few minutes of this gradient could be a killer. 3.2 watts per kilogram. Just passing Jay Goldberg's name again there with his pluses on the road. Chalk painters have been out overnight adding everyone's name. Put on, up and into 3.4 watts per kilogram here. Stretching his legs as he sees there's only 270 meters left to go. The finish line is just about to come into sight for him. Entering into this flatter section. His power bar is going red. He's putting all his effort in now. He might be the last ride on the road, but he still wants to put in a good time. Hundred and thirty meters. The finish line's in sight. Sixty meters, twenty meters, and he's over the line in just under one hour fifty-one minutes. It's a great ride from put on for someone who's new to the platform and someone who's new to this race series. So on to the review. Live results coming in. Anton Hulselmans coming over the line in 1 hour 20 minutes 55. He's had a watt per kilogram of 3.89. I don't think there's any way that the race control will allow that to stand. Um, it is Derek Bucock's decision, but I, I think we'll expect to see Hulselmans disqualified as he was in one of the earlier races of the, the series in race one. Um, fortunately, Hulselmans was in the group with uh, some of the riders. He didn't really affect the drafting on the descent and you can't really affect the, the drafting too much on the uphill. So it didn't affect the race, didn't, didn't ruin it for the other riders who were underneath uh, the watt per kilogram cap. Um, Oystensen in second place there for Team 3R, a time of one hour, 30 minutes. Uh, great riding, but I believe that Oystensen will find himself bumped up to first place after a doping control, I've had a look at Hulselman's performance. Goldberg, again, came in in third. One hour, 39 minutes, not a time to be sniffed at. He came in at 3.04 watts per kilogram. Um, second place, Steve Noble, third place. Not too far off. Goldberg, there he was, catching quite well at the end. 2.96 watts per kilogram. Um, perhaps he just weighted it better in the, in the grouping on the descending section. The first 10 kilometers of this race was mostly descent. And if you did get your avatar position well, you can make great watt per kilogram saving on those sections. Tim Cook, he's the leader overall in this series. Um, not quite as consistent a performance. Perhaps the, 
the sustained climbs don't suit him as well as the punchier climbs that we've seen in the rest of the series. One hour, 41 minutes, 55 seconds, an average 2.78 watts per kilogram. Chris Little, I think we're going to bump him up to fifth. He's had a great ride, um, very consistent all the way throughout that stage. Evo Lubrix, one hour, 46 and 35. And for a moment there, he did look like he was going to catch Chris Little, got the gapping down to 80 meters, but then all of a sudden that gap just opened up again. Perhaps a bad gear change by Liebrix, or perhaps he just found that his lactic had built up in his legs and he just had to ease back a little bit. And Alexander Perdon, great riding again, one hour 50, just coming under the one hour 51 minute mark um, for a rider who's new to the platform. It's great to see him riding as the last rider on the road, a couple of abandons tonight, um, but putting in the effort all the way to the finish line. Great to see that from Alexander Perdon. Uh, Great riding all round. We'll be back to cover some more of the team through our racing. Um, I think the next ride that we're covering is the Monday night race your racing puncher. Um, this has been VCN virtual cycling news commentary brought to you with a live stream from ZMS live stream. And you can also catch it on ESTV.co. Um, as always, the live stream, if you've missed it live, you can pick it up on ZMS Livestream's Facebook page. Um, next time around when we're commentating ZMS Livestream, you can go on their Facebook page. You can ping us a comment, tell us some of the information that we're missing from the ride, something interesting. Um, pick out a rider, one of your friends that's racing, and just be inter interacting with us. Um, it's great to get comments through, like Kate who's been race, watching the racing tonight, just uh, dropping in a hello on the live stream. But yeah, keep on interacting, keep on watching.